and we are officially recording. Welcome to the first ever recorded edition of UW Student Seminars. I am Landon Burnett, a 2A student in computer science and pure mathematics here at the University of Waterloo. And today I want to talk about a topic that kind of straddles the lines between the realms of CS and math. I wanted to unite my two very different disciplines together into one seminar. So I've decided to take a topic that is sort of the intersection between number theory and theoretical computer science. And that topic is called automatic sequences. And essentially, in a non-mathematical definition, what automatic sequences are, are sequences that can be determined by theoretical computer machines. And so we're going to start off by looking at the properties of words within mathematics. Then we're going to do a few definitions within theoretical computer science to build our understanding of things called DFAs, or deterministic finite automata. And then finally, we're going to get into automatic sequences proper. And then we'll look at uh, some powerful theorems, as Pepe might say, within automatic sequences, as well as some interesting applications they might have, one of which is drawn on the board right there. It might not look like it right now, but it is. OK, so let's get started here with some properties of these things called words. So our first definition is that an alphabet is just a non-empty set of symbols. Symbols we do not define mathematically. They can be whatever you want. Anything you can draw, anything, anything that exists, maybe it doesn't even exist. Anything's a symbol. It just has to be put into a set. And the set is called the alphabet. And we usually denote it sigma, and if we have a second alphabet, like we will later on when we're doing some proofs, we're going to denote the second alphabet by a capital delta. And in particular, we have a special alphabet. The alphabet composed of 0 to k minus 1 is just denoted sigma k. And that one comes up a lot, so that's why we have a special notation for it. Our next definition is that of a word. And a word is a finite or infinite collection of concatenated symbols. So what concatenation means is you take one thing, you take another thing, and you just put the two together. Slap them side by side, glue them together. No more, no less. And so it's concatenated symbols from some alphabet sigma. And it's usually represented, the word, by the letter W. And if we have already used W, we can use other lowercase letters in its stead. And so then the set of finite words of our alphabet sigma is denoted sigma star. And of course, the length of a word W will be denoted by these absolute value bars around W. And finally, if we want to reverse a word, we can denote the reverse of a word where we switch all the positions of the first and last, etc., with WR. We write the R on top like that. So now we're going to do a uh, more important definition that isn't something immediately fundamental within the theory of words. We're going to do something called a morphism, also known as a homeomorphism, but, oh sorry, homomorphism, one of the two. But theoretical computer scientists hate long words, so they're just going to abbreviate it to morphism. That's what they always do. The cool kids say morphism, so you should too. All right, so we're going to let sigma and delta, see, I told you it would happen, two alphabets. We're going to let them be alphabets. So then a morphism, which we will denote H, is going to be a map. And that map will take us from sigma star to delta. So from the words of one alphabet to the other alphabet. OK? Oh, to delta star. Yeah, words in one alphabet to words in another alphabet. With this property. So for any two words, 
If we just apply the morphism to their concatenated cells, this does not actually represent multiplication in this case, it's concatenation. And we apply the morphism afterwards, it's the same as applying the morphism individually and then concatenating the results. That's what a morphism is. And one thing to note is that we don't actually have to define a morphism for all of sigma star in order for it to be considered completely defined and valid. We can actually just define it on sigma itself because then after that, we can just use this property here to build up all the possible words. So once it's defined on just our alphabet sigma, we consider it completely defined. And further, we can iterate morphisms. So we let the zeroth iteration of a morphism on a word x just be x itself, because you're not applying anything to it. And then for n greater than or equal to 1, we're going to get let the nth iteration be equal to h applied to the n minus first iteration, which is the instinctive way to think about these things. You can just iterate this thing many times. So in terms of automatic sequences, there is a really interesting sequence that will motivate a lot of our study today, which it turns out is automatic. We'll prove that later on. And what it's called is the Thumor sequence. So the sequence is generated as follows. Start with the number zero. Take what you have so far, and then flip the bits and stick it on the end. So we're considering the Boolean negation of it, which means all the zeros go to ones, and all the ones go to zeros. So then the second term is going to be 0, 1. And then if we apply that again, take what you already have, and then append the Boolean negation, you're going to get 0, 1, 1, 0. Once again, following the same procedure, 0, 1, 1, 0, and then you append the Boolean negation, 1, 0, 0, 1. And this continues forever. This is an infinite sequence. This has some really interesting properties, one of which is the fact that in a fair duel, where the accuracy of the shooters approaches zero, this is actually the most fair way to conduct such a duel between two people. If their accuracy gets really low, where zero represents one person shooting and one represents the other person shooting. And that's just one of the many applications of this sequence. It's a really interesting one. But what we can show now that we've defined a morphism is that the Thumor sequence is a morphism. Specifically, it's the following. We can define it as mu. Well, it's going to be mu on the alphabet sigma 2, which, if you recall from our definition over there, is going to be 0, 1. Those are all the things we need. And so then, mu of 0, well, this is actually going to go to a different alphabet. And the alphabet it's going to go to, we're going to define delta to be equal to 0, 1, 1, 0 as symbols. We can do that. And so this guy is going to go to 0, 1, which makes sense given the first two terms of the sequence. And then mu of 1, on the other hand, is going to go to 1, 0. And this completely defines the morphism. So then, if you want the nth term, in the Thumor sequence, a n will simply be given by the nth iteration of mu with 0. OK? So that wraps up our uh, little snippet on math stuff. The next step is to go into the realm of computer science. Don't groan, some of you. I know you hate CS, some of you. Some of you probably also love it. This isn't programming. We're not going to be programming stuff today. Fortunately, because if I tried to program something on the board, I'd get it wrong every time. <laughs> well, yeah, you can't prove it's wrong. So we'll say it's right. All right, so we're going to do some definitions in uh, theoretical computer science now. And the first thing we're going to talk about is called a deterministic finite automaton. It 
Now, this is best explained in words first rather than math, because the mathematical definition of this thing is among the ugliest I've ever seen. Like, it's a terrible definition. We're going to do it later, but it's best to explain it in words first. So pretty much, a DFA, picture it as just some box. What we do is we're going to shove words into it as input, and it will read the characters of the word. Let's, uh, let's say the characters are w1, w2, w3, dot, dot, dot. It will read the characters one at a time. Now, it will begin in an initial state, and then what will happen is depending on what word is read, it will transition to a new state according to a transition function, or rather a mapping. So if we look at this guy over here, you can kind of see, start to see how the transition mapping works. For here, we, we have, if you get zero, you go one way, and if you go one, you go another. So any DFA is going to be like that. Depending upon what you read, you're going to go in potentially a different direction. And then, once we're finished reading all of the symbols in the word, this thing's deterministic. So what deterministic means is it will always determine something. And specifically, in the case of a DFA, what it determines is whether the input is accepted or rejected. So an input can either be accepted or rejected, and it's accepted if after reading through your input, you land on something called an accepted state. We define a set of accepted states within the DFA, and if you land on one of those, you're good. Your input's accepted. If you land on something other than one of those, that's a rejected state, and your input's no good. Okay? Now let's do this formally. So then a DFA is actually going to be defined as a five-tuple M equals Q sigma delta Q0 F. I told you this was ugly. It gets better. We're going to have to define all of these guys. So Q is a finite set of states. That's where the DFA gets the word finite from there being a finite set of states in it. Sigma is a finite alphabet, finite input alphabet, that is. That's where we're taking our words from. We're taking our words constructed from sigma star. Next one is delta, which is actually a function called the transition function. And it is from Q cross sigma over to Q. So I'll explain what this notation means for those of you who don't know. What this cross means is the Cartesian product, which means you take one thing from Q, you take one thing from sigma, you put them together in a pair. And then that pair gets mapped to something in Q. And we kind of saw that with our heuristic explanation of how these things work. You're in a state. That's the thing you pick from Q. You read a letter. That's the thing you pick from sigma. And those two things together will determine which state you move to. That's pretty much how the transition function works. And then Q0, which is an element of Q, is the initial state. So that's the one we start in before moving, before having read any words. And if you pass the empty word, which is usually denoted epsilon and contains no symbols, if you pass that into a DFA, then you just land on, well, you don't do anything. You stay on your first state, your initial state there. And finally, F, which is a subset of Q, is the set of accepted states. So, computer scientists of the olden days, theoretical computer scientists, looked at these DFAs and they said, this isn't horrible enough. We aren't torturing enough people with this notation. Let's make it worse. So they decided to make it worse. And this is how they made it worse. 
they turned a DFA into a DFAO, which is a deterministic finite automaton with output. Now we have output added to the mix. And essentially how that works is we no longer really have to have a notion of accepted states. Because if something is accepted, it will always be printed, right? So what we do is we instead, well, we instead replace our notion of accepted states with another function. It's going to be called tau. And that function is going to determine what gets outputted depending upon where we are. So this is a DFAO. And what we do here is we denote the output by the slash right there. So for example, if you land on this state after reading through your whole word, you're going to output a 0. Well, And then if you land on 1, you're going to output a 1, right? Make sense? Formally, mathematically speaking, though, this DFAO is a 6-tuple. Yes, even worse than 5. 6 is worse than 5. And it's going to be defined as follows. So m equals q, sigma, we know those. Delta, we know. q0, we know. Big delta's new. He's another alphabet. And he's the alphabet that these things are being output in. That's the output alphabet. Whereas sigma is the input alphabet. And then finally, we got tau. And tau is the output function. So we'll just write those two guys down here. Big delta is our output alphabet. And then tau is the output function. And of course, tau, it's a terrible tau. It's a bit better. Someone after this want to teach me how to draw a tau or something? Anybody know? <laughs> so yeah, tau is going to be defined as q cross delta mapped. Wait, no. Actually, no, it's actually just going to be q to delta. What am I thinking? We can make it a lot easier. So yeah, q is just going to go to something in delta. We can get something as an output there. OK? And specifically, you might wonder why I have the number 2 up here. Any guesses what it means? It has two states? Not specifically two states, but good idea. It's actually the alphabet that we're using. And so if our sigma in this case is sigma k for some k, then it's known as a k DFAO. And this guy over here is a 2 DFAO because we're taking stuff from 0 and 1. OK? Now, you might be wondering why I drew this specific one. I know it looks like an easy example, but there's actually a reason I drew it. And that is because this is the 2 DFAO for the through Morse sequence, which you might be able to see by trying in your mind to plug some things in. We'll look at this in more formal detail in a second. And, uh, well, we won't get into that right now. First, we get to come to the part of the talk that was promised to you. If I called this thing automatic sequences and then never showed you an automatic sequence, I have a feeling I'd get some pretty negative reviews. <laughs> Maybe even like a pitchfork and torch thing. Ran out of the city. Don't run me out of the city, please. I'm from here. Like I've lived here my whole life in KW. I won't know where to go.
Oh look, the automatic sequences header, right when we're doing automatic sequences. So we're ready to define an automatic sequence now. So consider a sequence. This is the theoretical CS notation of sequence. I know it's not the one we normally use. Some people deem it acceptable, some people don't. Don't have my head for it, please. It's gonna be a finite alphabet. So consider this over a finite alphabet delta. So the sequence is going to be called k-automatic if there exists some k-dfao, just in case you guys thought I was just showing you CS stuff for no reason, m defined in the usual way. So we got our q, sigma, delta, q0, big delta, and tau, hey, that was a good tau. Nice. So that's going to be our definition we roll with. This might look a bit weird at first. We got a whole bunch of symbols and brackets here. Might remind you of the CS 245 assignment from last night, Tane. But what's actually happening here is we're just apl applying our two functions to some of our parameters. So we have our initial state, and then we feed in some word. And this word is going to be within our alphabet. Uh, this is actually going to be sigma k. That's the important part. And we feed that in, and then with our initial state, to the transition function. And the transition function here is just going to read the word in one character at a time, and we are going to move throughout the sequence. Well, sorry, throughout the DFA, which is going to make the sequence after we apply our output function tau to it. So applying tau after movement will output stuff. And that's what's going to get us what we want. All right. So now we're going to prove something that we've been taking for granted for a while. The Thumor sequence is too automatic. How are we going to prove this? We're going to use an alternate definition of what the Thumor sequence means. So the Thumor sequence is actually, under an alternate definition, the number of ones in the binary representation of our n in that sequence mod 2. That seems like a really weird definition, but it's going to be incredibly convenient for us when we go to do things with this 2 DFAO here. Okay? And so if you're not familiar with what this mod means, as you might not be, 
it pretty much means the remainder upon division by two. So an easy way to think about this would be this thing is going to be one if there's an odd number of ones in the binary representation of n. And it's going to be zero if there's an even number of ones in the binary representation of n. OK? So what we're going to do now is a proof by induction. I know you love those. OK, so this proof by induction goes as follows. So consider tau of delta of q0, 0. What we're, what's going to happen here is we're going to start at q0, and we're going to feed a 0 into the input stream in the machine. And that machine is going to see the 0, and it's going to follow the 0 path here and go back to itself and output a 0. And how many ones are in the binary representation of 0? Zero? Zero. 0. 0, yeah. So this works, because 0 is an even number. I'm just going to abbreviate this. This means number of ones in the binary representation, because I really don't have to want to write that a bunch of times. So we're going to abbreviate it, OK? So this is the number of ones in the binary representation is equal to 0, which is even. And now we're going to do a similar thing for tau of delta of q0, and then we feed in a 1. And what happens here is we start here, we feed in the 1, and we go over here. Land here, and it outputs a 1. So this is going to equal 1. And the number of ones in the binary representation of 1 is 1, which is odd. So it holds for our base cases there. And now to continue on the induction, We're going to assume we have something that goes to 0. Some sequence that gives us something that goes to 0. So assume delta of q0 w is equal to q0. And w is just going to have some positive length. So then w is going to have an even number of 1s in it, because that's what this thing tells us. That's what determines when the few more sequence output stuff, and this is our assumption, that it holds for some word w, our principle that we're trying to prove. Then consider tau of delta of q0 and then w, and we're going to concatenate a 0 onto it. What happens there? Well, picture this. We fed in a word w. We've moved around a whole bunch of times, bounced all around this DFAO here, and we've landed here. And then we feed in another 0 after that. That's going to take us back to our original 0. That equals 0. And, well, w has an even number of 1s in its binary representation. And we just tacked on a 0 to w. That clearly also has an even number of 1s because we didn't change the number of 1s. So 
so we good. And then also, if we do it the other way, and we try to concatenate a 1 onto W, then what happens there is we loop around for a while, do the thing that W does, land on 0. Then we get a 1, and we fly over there. To here, this state there, that outputs a 1. So then this is equal to 1, and well, we know that W has an even number of zeros in its binary representation. Sorry, an even number of 1s in its binary representation. And we just tacked on another 1. So that's going to make the number of 1s in the binary representation odd. So if we've got some sequence W that lands on Q0, anything we do to it will preserve the property that's desired. And we just make a claim that the argument for Q1, if we land on Q1 and then apply stuff, it's going to be analogous. And you can see that because we're doing the same thing, e thing each time. Zero loops, one travels. Zero loops, one travels. So since this is a symmetric argument, we can just conclude our proof and write a nice beautiful square. All right. But there's a little problem with this. And the problem is that W is not just going to be numbers. It's going to have a binary representation of some numbers, some number, but it can also have an arbitrary number of leading zeros. We don't want that. That sucks. That's a terrible characterization for our automatic sequence. So what we're going to do is eliminate the need for that entirely by proving this. So the sequence that we have before is k-automatic if and only if There exists some KDFO, DFAO, as normal, M defined in the usual way, such that M is also equal to the following. And then this right here means N in base K. for all n greater than or equal to 0. And then one more thing further. We can choose our m such that delta of q0, 0 is equal to q0, which means that we can always have some sort of DFAO, KDFAO, where if we're on our initial state and we apply to zero, apply it to zero, it will give us back zero. That's going to be our technique precisely for getting rid of the leading zeros. Because we're going to start in our initial state, pass all those leading zeros in, and it's just going to loop a bunch of times and bring us back to our original thing, right? That's the idea behind that. We're going to make a really ugly definition here. But first, well, how many people did I just trigger by writing that? <laughs> it actually is trivial. Because if you think back to our definition of what an automatic sequence is, well, there's always going to be a K, K, uh, a K, a, a K D F A O. Way too many letters in computer science, man. There's always going like if something is K automatic, then there's going, it's going to work, in the forward case. 
In the reverse case, however, we're going to need to define something. Okay? And what we're going to define here is we're going to define another machine, M prime, which is equal to the following. So the alphabets are going to remain the same. That's the important part. And how we define this is that Q prime is going to equal Q, where we just add the state Q naught prime. Now, it might not be a new thing. Because we have the union here, if it so happens that Q zero prime is something that is already in our machine that we've drawn, that's totally fine. It'll just be absorbed into the union. So it could be something we already have, or it could potentially be something new. And now we're going to define delta as follows. It's going to behave for any of our states that we already have. It's going to behave exactly like our old function delta. And then if we place it on our new Q prime, Q zero prime, it's going to act the same as it would on our old initial state for all A not equal to zero. And then finally, the big one, the one we wanted all along, is that our delta prime of Q zero prime and zero itself is just going to give us our initial state back. And what this looks like diagrammatically on our transition diagram here is something like this. So this guy might not go to zero, okay? Actually, let's draw a new one. We Say we have some transition diagram already where it can go places just draw a third guy here. Maybe this guy loops to himself with something. Looks sort of like that, right? This could be some sort of transition diagram. We don't really care what because we're considering an arbitrary case. But what we do is we're adding some new circle here with the property that it behaves exactly like our old initial state. Okay, so it's going to map to all the other positionings in the same way that our old initial state is going to map. And then the other condition is that zero will always map to this new guy over and over again. And that's going to get rid of our leading zeros. And finally, some cleanup work definitions. Our new output function, when it reaches this guy, it's just going to output the same thing as Q0. So essentially our output is going to remain the same even though we added this new guy. And then similarly, tau prime of Q is just going to be equal to Q for all Q and Q. So we're just extending our original transition function, not sorry, uh, output function, from this machine here to this machine along with a potentially new state. Again, it doesn't have to be a new state. In some scenarios, we may be able to pick something that's already within our KDFAO, but we're always going to be able to extend that tau function to cover it and output things in the exact same way. And formally, mathematically speaking, for all i greater than or equal to zero, what we're going to have is that tau prime of delta prime of q zero prime of 
some amount of zeros, i amount of zeros in a row, followed by the base k representation of n, is going to be tau prime of delta prime of q0 prime and just the thing itself. Because all these zeros, every time we hit a zero, when we're initially scanning, while we're still in our initial state, the new initial state that we just defined, we're going to be looping around. And that's going to help us get rid of all those leading zeros. OK? And that is just going to be equal to tau prime of delta prime of q0 and n in base k. Proof. Now we can talk about a couple interesting things related to automatic sequences, specifically the through Morse sequence. So like I mentioned earlier, if we picture this duo below, let's say these guys are really bad shots. And we'll give this guy glasses for some, it looks like he's a swimmer now. <laughs> So what's going to happen here is these two guys are in a duel to the death. One of them has to die, but they're both really bad shots. Let's say that S is their shot percentage, and we're going to make S go to zero for both of them. So they will miss a lot. This duel could go on for millions of years of them just missing. And the question that mathematicians for some reason ask, I can't explain why, is if this goes on for a really long time, what's the most fair order to make them shoot in? <laughs> so one order that might come up if you're thinking about it is just the order 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, etc if you've got dude zero here and dude one here. It's alternating, right? It's totally fair. But it's not really the most fair, because as these diminish to zero, this guy still has a little chance to kill this guy on the first blow before he can even do anything. And then after that, in a little sub-chance of that, this guy is going to have a guaranteed kill on him before he can retaliate. So what you got is two different, essentially, geometric series converging to different things, but because this one started first, it's going to converge to something higher, and then after a thousand years, this guy's going to claim, hold up, hold up, you're biased. You're biased, man. You can't do this order. This guy's going to win. He's got an advantage. And after a thousand years, any sane person would be like, who cares? How are you still alive at this point? Either of you should have died from starvation 900 years ago, yet you're still shooting at each other right now. But of course, a mathematician's like, oh, you're right. It's not fair. I need to optimize this. Start again. And then a wise mathematician would look at the few more sequence and then construct it. So we got our 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, et cetera, and say, OK. See this infinite sequence generated by this, these big blobs up here? I want you to shoot in that sequence forever. And these guys would be like, oh, OK. <laughs> and then, after an endless amount of time, assuming these guys are perfectly good mathematicians, they'd realize <laughs> that they have an equal chance of killing each other, or at least as close as we can possibly get. This is the most fair sequence, and the reason for that is that if you take any contiguous block of length 2 to the n, the next block will mirror it. It will perfectly mirror it. In fact, does, doesn't even have, yeah, any block, actually. Any, any block doesn't have to start at the beginning. You can go here, 
and then take another block and it will mirror it as well. Any block starting from anywhere in the sequence of any size 2 to the n is going to be mirrored by the next block of the same size. So what's happening is you're looking anywhere in this shooting lineup, anywhere you can think, you say, hold up, hold up, but he has an advantage here. Then you can say, but you have the exact same advantage right after that. And I know this isn't a mathematically rigorous argument, but it explains in an intuitive sense why it works. That whenever somebody says something's unfair, you can just slap them on the wrist and say, hey, you get the same thing right afterwards. Reminds me of my experiences in life as a kid. As a kid, <laughs> no, not the shooting part. <laughs> I didn't grow up in that bad a neighborhood. <laughs> but what happened was, my sister and I would always fight for control of the one computer we had. And we tried to wrest control of it from one another. So my parents ended up devising this system that, okay, well, you write down what happened. And then if at any point you think it's unfair, you come to us and we'll reverse it. This actually happened to me. My parents are really bad at math. But somehow they, along with the many awesome mathematicians, happened to figure out that the two more sequence is the best order for any problem equivalent to the firing problem here. <laughs> so this actually ended up working out, and my sister and I reached a compromise. It was sort of a game theoretic compromise, though, because we were at a, a standoff. Neither of us wanted to complain, <laughs> because we knew that once we complained, the other would get it back, and then they'd complain, it would become anarchy. Once again, I'm not here to do an anarchist speech, like I said earlier. <laughs> so yeah, that's an application of the Thew Moore sequence. Another interesting one is that we can define a turtle graphics function. A turtle graphics, pretty much, you give it commands. It's a program. Oh god, I, I, I said I wasn't going to talk about programming, but I guess I'm going to talk about programming now. <laughs> Don't worry, we're only going to talk about like pseudocode programming. So we start with a point here, okay? And then what we do is we read the through more sequence into the program. And then we apply a function f to it, and f is going to be defined as move one forward if zero, if the thing we pass in is zero, and then Rotate this way, counterclockwise, but I don't have enough room to write counterclockwise in the rest of the words on this line, by an angle of pi over 3. And what actually happens if you pass the through more sequence in like this to turtle graphics, it will draw something known as this, which I will not pronounce. This thing, has anyone ever heard of it? Yeah. Yeah. What is it? It's a fractal. Yeah, it's a fractal. Automatic sequences are highly related to fractals. And that's because of their generative nature from these guys over here. The DFAOs, the machines that generate them. And for pretty much any automatic sequence, I think, I don't know if it's a theorem that applies to all of them, but for any automatic sequence that you can think of, or that I can think of, <laughs> you can generate a fractal from it somehow. This becomes the Koch snowflake. There's another sequence called the paper folding sequence. And what the paper folding sequence says is fold a piece of paper in half some arbitrary number of times. Then unfold it and look what you made. In what order did you make things that are mountains and valleys? And what we do is we denote a mountain by a 1. We denote a valley by a minus 1, or something like that. You can use other numbers too, but 1 and negative 1 tend to work the best. And what happens is if you draw the mountains and valleys out, it converges to something 
called a dragon curve. Now obviously my artistic skills are pretty limited. So I, I'm not I'm not gonna be able to draw a dragon curve or that for you. <laughs> But you can look it up, and I highly recommend you do. You can look up what the dragon curve is. It's a really fascinating shape. And you can look up all sorts of other automatic sequences and the shapes that they create. And you can also now look up a lot more things about automatic sequences because of the introduction that I've given you today. You are now inducted in the world of automatic sequences. <laughs> Without knowing it, you've just engaged in a cult-like ritual with me <laughs> for the last hour or so. And I now induct you into the secret cult of automatic sequences. You know about them, you know their basic properties, you know that leading zeros don't matter when you pass stuff into them, and now you have the tools at your disposal to investigate more about them. And I hope that one day when you find some really kick-ass automatic sequence somewhere, that makes a beautiful fractal, you think, oh, I'm so glad Landon gave that presentation to me in 2017 about automatic sequences. I'm gonna go pay him money now, royalties from this fractal that I discovered. <laughs> well, yeah, I hope you guys have a great rest of the evening and I hope, I hope you'll find some more beauty in the world of math. Thank you.